Welcome to KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe 2022, happening in Valencia, España. Woohoo! Yeah! <laughs> what a beautiful city. We are in Orange Town. <laughs> How is the journey for you all coming over here? Yeah? Awesome! Very nice. For many folks, it's our first international trip since the pandemic started. I think maybe some of us might be a little rusty uh, with IRL engagement. So I would recommend let's all go out of our way to be kind, respectful, and professional with another this week, and of course, beyond. Now, many of you, it's your first time joining in the community. In fact, let's do a gut check. How many of you are attending a KubeCon Cloud Native Con for the first time? Oh my gosh, shout me. Keep your hands up and say me. I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear it. How many of you are attending a KubeCon Cloud Native Con for the first time? Awesome, wow, look at that. And just as you saw right now, you're not alone. In fact, 65% of our attendees this week are first time attenders. You know, this ecosystem, it's large, it's getting mature. And at the same time, we're still moving at the speed of light. It can be overwhelming. I have a lot of empathy for you because I too was once just starting out and things were just whizzing past me. And so I figured with so many fresh faces in the audience, with all these changes going on, especially by the way, it, last KubeCon Cloud Native Con in LA, we were at 114 projects. And now we're at 128 in just six months. So things, things can go very quickly. And so I figured maybe it might be helpful if I shared some of my learnings from my journey through Cloud Native with you. So CNCF was formed in 2015 with the donation of Kubernetes by Google to the Linux Foundation. I joined the ecosystem in 2016. This is a photo from that time. Youth, oh, those were the days. <laughs> so I got involved because I met Ben Sigelman who had built observability systems uh, at scale at Google back in a time when there were not so many, if any, parallels out there. While I had experience in open source, systems were new for me. But I was immediately taken by the complexity and beauty of Ben's world. In order to learn from him, I decided to join his company, Lightstep. And over time, I gained enough knowledge to be able to have in-the-field experiences with end users. To this day, my work in observability stands me in good stead in my efforts in Cloud Native. And that's why it is my humble advice to you that there is no substitute for immersing yourself in the technology. There are many opportunities for learning and development today to do just that. And we at LF produce trainings and certifications, as do other folks. There's lots of options out there. Um, in fact, do you know that year over year, the number of people taking our certification exams is growing by 216%. Over 1,000 people take a certification test every week. I'm going to share some info about exciting news on the certification front later in the announcements section of my keynote. So hang tight. Now, going back, Open Tracing was the project that I used to work on, and it was the third one to join CNCF in 2016. 
And that very year in November, I attended my first KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. And I gotta tell you, I experienced the pervasive kindness in this community for the first time when I was there. <laughs> By the way, back then we were so impressed, we were 700 people. That was six years ago. By the way, how many people do you think are here today? Anyone wanna take a guess at how many attendees at KubeCon Cloud Native Con this week? Just yell out a number. 3,000, 5,000, you're getting there? Boom, that's right. Over 7,000 folks are attending the event with over 10,000 attending virtually. We are officially sold out. Good job, folks. Yeah, this is all of us. So going back, going back to the story I was telling you. So back then in the KubeCon, CloudNativeCon at 2016, this group of 700 folks was primarily made up of the world's few experts, people who had been working on complex software systems for years, decades even. I felt very out of place. I remember vividly walking into a Kubernetes meetup on the eve of the event, imposter syndrome, or reality perhaps, just attacking me. I was no expert. I was just a fan of the complex, beautiful systems that these people knew how to manage and wrangle. What was I even doing here? My knees shook and anxiety wrecked my mind and body. I looked around and I saw a group of four people who were clearly at ease, who definitely belonged. As I looked at them, I felt yearning. I wanted to be like them. And I was so shocked because before I knew it, those very people, that group, they beckoned over to me, asked me to join them, and pulled me into a conversation. They made me feel wanted, asked about my aspirations, and made it very clear that being a learner was something to be proud of. It was a very special feeling. I belonged. You know, as someone who was a friendless dork through all of high school and most of college, this really meant a lot to me. <laughs> and I carry their kindness in my heart to this day. So that's my second piece of advice to you. If your knees are shaking, if you feel out of place, afraid to join in because of your own concerns about your knowledge level, just hang in there. Stay here and let yourself get comfortable. There are over 156,000 code contributors in Cloud Native, which by the way, up from 137,000 just six months ago at the previous KubeCon Cloud Native Con. But all that is to say, there's lots like you. People will pull you in and you will join their ranks. In the grand history of open source, the cloud native ecosystem is unique in how fast it brought together industry heavyweights to collaborate. My experience is that in order to be long-term successful here, there is a need to bring professionalism and collaboration that is perhaps unprecedented. I learned this most clearly when I was elected to the CNCF governing board, surrounded by some of the biggest investors in cloud native with the likes of Google, SAP, uh, Alibaba, Amazon, so many others. I met leaders essential to creating this industry collaboration that we call the Kubernetes ecosystem. In this environment, I found my opinions and my employer's aspirations were important, but they had to make sense in the context of the other folks in the room. I encourage you to bring that same awareness to your interactions in Cloud Native. But it's not that easy. I mean, when we met last November, or was it October? I don't remember anymore. It was, we had actually 728 
members. And just in the last six months, we are over 800 companies. With that many folks, and then there's hundreds of projects. So disagreements are bound to pop up. The collaboration is critical, but why is it so hard? Well, in order to collaborate successfully, we need to bring kindness, respect, and internalize that we're all in it together. But it can be challenging with so many different perspectives. You know, I'd like to show, demonstrate that to you with something that my mentor, Jim Zemlin, sh shared once, and it really stuck with me. Let's look at this glass of water. I'm holding it, and I look through it, and I see all of you through the glass. Look at a different angle. I see you look different to me. And I'm sure when you look through this, you don't see what I'm seeing. You see me, and you see this stage. Same glass of water, different perspectives. Have a sip now. <laughs> so, since I took this role as executive director, I have witnessed all kinds of interactions in the community coming from very passionate and different perspectives. Passion drives us, and it's good. Interestingly, it brings a particular challenge to us in the staff, because we are tasked with finding the best outcome for the largest number of people, and we need to hear from everybody. Well, that makes sense, but everybody, by the way, means 7.1 million developers at this point. We're larger than the country of Denmark as a community. So given that, how do we navigate this big, messy, unique, diverse ecosystem towards the North Star of making cloud native ubiquitous? Well, I figured we could all use a little bit of guidance and help. So I phoned a friend. Friends and colleagues, please welcome a dear friend of the Linux Foundation, renowned CNN host, an expert on finding uncommon ground, Van Jones. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. It worked. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Van. Uh, I would love it if you'd please tell our global audience a little bit about yourself. Well, I, I'm somebody who um, has tried to build bridges uh, in a country that, as you know, the United States is uh, the most diverse, one of the most diverse countries in the history of the world. Um, I have tried to build bridges and I have learned uh, that um, the payoff is extraordinary. For instance, I've been able to work with uh, three Democratic administrations and two Republican administrations over the course of the past 25 years um, and not agreeing on everything. But we were able to get 10,000 green jobs, clean energy jobs to low-income folks. Uh, we were able to get uh, 20,000 people who were in federal prison uh, home safely. Uh, we were able to get coal miners uh, their uh, health benefits and, and pensions back. Nice. fights that people said were completely impossible, uh, especially given the political divisions, but we were able to find a way to get it done. And uh, I've learned that I've never seen a bird fly with only a left wing. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen a, a bird fly with only a right wing. Uh, we need each other. Uh, the yeah. differences actually uh, give us the ability to get things done when we can get past the 99 things we don't agree on, find the one thing we do, yeah. and get something done about that one thing. And so I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a bridge builder and I'm just so happy to be a part of this conversation. Awesome, thank you for joining us, Van. And based on what your experience is, I'd love to ask you a question. As our community grows larger, we're united in our mission to build technology a certain way, but beyond that, we're a pretty diverse bunch. How can we effectively collaborate when there are lots of different views and ideas? Well, first of all, I think the importance of what you're doing uh, has to be kept uh, first and foremost. 
Uh, this is probably the most important uh, community uh, in the tech space. Uh, you're, you're, you're carrying a mission forward that's bigger than anybody's uh, ego or anybody's uh, position. Uh, and, and you know, frankly, the, the future of what humanity can do together through technology is really in your hands. And so I think that there's a certain reverence <laughs> uh, for who and what you've created that has to always uh, be there, number one. Number two, um, you have to ask yourself the, the question, you know, people are gonna fight, people are gonna disagree. Uh, disagreement's not a bad thing. It's disrespect that's a bad thing. Disagreement is good, but disrespect is destructive. So the question is, when a disagreement comes up, how do you act? Here's the, the guideline for us. If everyone in the situation did exactly what I'm doing, exactly the way I'm doing it, would we have a community? Could we actually stay together? So I'm mad. Uh, somebody said something I didn't like. If I tear them a new one, if I go in to say, the, just kick their butt, um, if everybody who's mad did that every single time, would we have a community? Well, no, probably not. Yeah. So, 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 so thinking to myself, the what I'm doing, uh, you know, basically can create a, I guess in your world, can, can create a positive or a negative virus. If you guys know more technology talk than I do, but you know, what kind of virus are you creating? Uh, what kind of virus are you spreading? That is, I think, a, a key, a key question. But the principle is, um, no matter what happens, I have to conduct myself in a way that if everybody else followed my example, we would still have a community and we could still get Makes things done. Sense. That is super helpful. I want to ask one more thing, and this draws into your research a little bit. In a community of our size, tribalism is bound to grow. It just happens. Can you tell us a little bit about this phenomenon and why it might impact collaboration and productivity? Well, you, know, you, you told that beautiful story about yourself uh, coming into a big space and feeling lonely, uh, feeling isolated. Uh, feeling like maybe you didn't belong. And then you happen to find a group that you were able to connect with. Well, luckily that group had values of inclusion and kindness and warmth. And so you got infected with that and then you, you spread that around. We sometimes fall in with groups um, that are coming from a place of more of lack, of hurt, of suspicion. And you begin to, to form around the wound or the sense of exclusion and then what you want to do is you start to attack others. That's called bad tribalism. Um, I think the, the, the opportunity that we have is to make sure that the groups that we're a part of, and of course you're going to form affinity groups, uh, mm -hmm. people who see things the same way or from the same country have something else in common, that's perfectly fine. But the question is, in a conflict, the two things you want to make sure are always present are space and grace. Uh, and you think about it yourself. If you do something that gives someone offense, and we've all done it, and you feel terrible, what's the one thing you want is just grace. True. You just want that person to assume the best about you yes. and give you the opportunity to learn. Or uh, sometimes when you feel uh, that you've been offended and you want to communicate that, what's the one thing you want? You just want the space to be able to share it uh, and to feel heard. Yes. Well, that grace and space developing, no matter what tribe you're in, subgroup you're in, affinity group you're in, making sure that you're uh, 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 valuing, giving people grace when they make a, mis a mistake and asking for space when you want to uh, communicate, uh, then the tribes actually wind up being uh, links in a chain. Uh, it actually it becomes a source of strength because you can reach out to this group and that group and the other group and people are able to cooperate. Uh, I can't uh, tell you how destructive though it can be to be on the receiving end of someone else's lack of grace. When you make a mistake or maybe it's not a mistake, you, you did something, you gave offense, and then that person comes at you, and we've all been through this, with so much force and so much anger and so much uh, uh, hostility and you're left there, maybe for them it was just a quick, you know, a couple of their thumbs just moved around a little bit, but you're left with that uh, pain. It makes it harder for you to do your job. It makes it harder for you to show up. It makes it harder for you to make your contribution. And so sometimes we knock each other out. 
and we're knocking out genius. We're knocking out perspective. We're knocking out uh, uh, maybe the answer to a question that could really change the world because we are treating each other with grace and giving each other space. And that's what you have to fight for in a big community like yours. That makes a lot of sense. So, man, this is, I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. Any final words of wisdom for all of us? You know, you matter. Uh, you individually matter. It's so easy to feel like, well, I'm just me and who cares and the world's so tough and whatever. Please don't believe that. Uh, if you have the ability uh, to, to, to master technology, to, to code, you know, it used to be that the future was written in law. It was written by lawyers like myself in, in parliaments and in, in courts, in legislatures, in executive branches. The future used to be written in law. Now the future is written in code. It's written in computer code. You are designing, you are creating the, the infrastructure for a new human civilization that is being born right now, where everybody gets to contribute, everybody gets to be a part of it because of what you're doing. That is a tremendous power. And as, as, as Spider-Man's Uncle Ben told him, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. You have tremendous power. You may have been a, a geek or whatever you're saying and, and, and left out and mistreated and laughed at and all sorts of stuff, all these different things. We all have those things, but that's not who you are now. You are in possession of magical powers that can, can change the world. And you're in a community that's designed to do that. That is an unbelievable gift and a source of real power. And I just ask you to use that power with kindness, use it with grace, use it with space. Please understand that if, if you're feeling upset, somebody else is feeling upset as well, but you have the power to create the grace and the space for that other person to learn with you, to grow with you, being able to partner across lines of difference is the superpower of the new century. And if you guys don't learn how to, how to partner together and you can put that into everything that you're doing, you'll accelerate the transition to a world where only a small number of people dominate everything to where everybody gets to play, everybody gets to participate, everybody gets to build like you do. Uh, I just wish you the very, very best in your uh, journey going forward to build a community that will let the rest of us have a good community uh, in, in this new century. Thank you so much, Van. Van Jones, everybody. <laughs> that was inspirational. But the reason I thought it would be helpful for us to hear from someone like Van, because as he said, we matter, we have power, and we can do so much for this world. Speaking of, how many of you here know Ihor Dvoretsky? Yes, Team Ihor. <laughs> Normally, as you know, Ihor is a developer advocate at CNCF, equally passionate about CI builds and art. He's a wonderful human being. These days, though, his reality is a little different. You see, Ihor is Ukrainian. And it makes me so proud to tell you, in the current world he lives in, our community has stepped up to support him in ways big and small. Let's hear from him directly. Hello, Kipcon. Hello, everyone from Ukraine. Sadly, I can't be with you all in person, and this is actually the first time in six years that I am not at KubeCon, whether in person or, or virtually. 84 days ago, my home was invaded, and now I'm serving in the armed forces of Ukraine defending my country, my family, my friends, and our right to live in peace. Our lives have changed for Iran and puts everything that has happened in my life up until this point into perspective. And you know, community has never been so important. From my community here in my home, my family, friends, my squad, to the global community all around us. We are standing together against Russia, united in our love for Ukraine and the modern liberal country 
we have worked so hard to build this part here, so up here. And actually, while I'm recording this message, the air raid sirens can be heard in many cities of Ukraine right now. However, I want to share why the ongoing support from you, the Team Cloud Native, is so much important. You might feel like there is nothing you can do to help. Uh, but one thing that you can really can't underestimate is that you are giving us hope. I am incredibly grateful for the support that you, the Cloud Native community, have shown us. When I joined the armored forces, I tweeted that we needed help with supplies and within minutes, hundreds of messages of support and offers of help are in. In fact, Operation Varetsky, an amazing project set up by the Team Cloud Native came about just because of one tweet. He organized supply runs for us, and that's because he saw one little tweet, tweet for assistance. The outpouring of generosity humbles me, and I would particularly like to thank Chris Lentriche, Richard Hartman, Chris Kuhl, Daniel Holbach, Zygmunt Kronitsky, Sasha Rosenbaum, Erica Bresch, and Jonah Bacon, Katrina Ivashenko, Chris Lennon Stolp, and my fellow CNCF and LF team, including Chris Anishik, Amy Scott, the parent, Priyanka Sharma, Flavia Sionka, Tim Servitz, and so many others who have stepped up beyond belief to help us out. And today we'll also hear from the Razum for Ukraine who are doing incredible things to help Ukraine. Please keep us in your thoughts and please keep on being kind to each other. Like I said, the past 84 days have put everything in my life up until now into perspective. You never know what other people are going through or have gone through. So while you are in Valencia, take time to stop and chat, meet new friends and greet the old ones. And keep the open mind to all the possibilities and experiences that await you over the next few days. I hope to see you all again soon. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Ihor. I am so, so proud to know you. Slava Ukraini, my friend. We heard, all right, let's do it. <laughs> we heard from Ihor about Operation Dwaretsky and also the Razom charity and the great work that they have done. I would like to invite Olena Nizhnekevich from Razam to come and share their efforts in Ukraine. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the Cloud Native C Computing Foundation, the Linux Foundation, and especially to Ihur for inviting us to be here today. My name is Elena Nizhnikevich from Razam for Ukraine, and I work with major and transformational donors. I'm here to invite you to help Ukraine win this war and return to peace, creativity, to travel, to fun. Ukraine and the Ukrainian armed forces need many things to win. If there's one thing that you'd like to contribute to, I'd invite you to support Yehuda's battalion or the organization Dazm for Ukraine. Ah, <laughs> I forgot to click. Razum, which means together in Ukrainian, believes in the enormous potential of dedicated volunteers around the world united by a single goal, to unlock the potential of Ukraine and to bring a prosperous and successful Ukraine. We work towards that mission by creating spaces where people meet, partner, and act, much like we're talking about here today. Razum for Ukraine was established in 2014 as a result of the Revolution of Dignity. Very soon after Maidan, Russia annexed Crimea and started an invasion into Donbass. The origin of our organization is in those days. 
we launched an emergency response project in 2014, and then we reopened it for COVID response in 2020. The emergency response is never what we want to do. We love doing projects in culture, education, building civic engagement. Unfortunately, time and time again, we have to go back to the emergency response. In February, we anticipated the need for the medical supplies should the full-scale invasion begin. We started procuring tactical medical supplies a week prior to February 24th, the beginning of the war. Takmed, a term that we use colloquially at Razum, now means everything to stop the bleeding and save lives. It includes tourniquets, blood-stopping gauzes, individual first aid kits. Razum has provided more than 200 tons of Takmed and hospital supplies and medications and communications devices that get delivered by our volunteers and partners throughout Ukraine to the regions that need it most, such as Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sume, Donetsk, Mykolaiv, Odessa, Dnipro, Dnipro, and Zaporizhia. We didn't anticipate the amount of resources we'd need to procure these supplies. I mean, like everyone, we were hoping this war would end quickly. But we're seeing that we definitely need more help. Um, our intention was initially to just train 100 medics within the civilian territorial defense forces, provide them with special backpacks full of supplies. But to date, we've procured over $17 million worth of TAC med and medical supplies. We send an average of more than 50 pallets of aid to Ukraine each week. In the first month of the war, we shipped over 218 tons of supplies. Of that, we've purchased more than 120,000 tourniquets. Let me break this down for you. So one tourniquet costs, because we get a bulk price for it, about $20. So we've spent over $2.5 million on tourniquets alone. And as you may have heard, there's a supply chain issue. And at times there aren't enough tourniquets for many of the people that are trying to buy them. Razum procures the supplies that we're sending ourselves in the US and Europe. We pack the supplies in a warehouse in New Jersey. We ship it to Ukraine, where we have a large team that then delivers it to the individual units on the ground. We also do some non-medical equipment, such as walkie-talkies and drones, as permitted by US law to help guide our delivery vehicles safely. We work through partner organizations on the ground to organize evacuations of children with special medical needs, some of which are on ventilators. We don't have them pictured here because it's dangerous to share their images. We provide medicine and food to internally displaced people like this lady here and people that have stayed in besieged cities who need medication and, and food. We continue to advocate in the US both through public protests and through our DC-based advocacy group. And the reason why we've been able to achieve this much is thanks to the generosity of people worldwide. As painful as it has been to witness this horrific war in Ukraine evolve, there have been many bright spots too. It's been incredible to witness the global response to the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. We had historically been an all-volunteer organization with about 4,000 donors and $250,000 in annual revenue. Since the war started, our organization has witnessed an enormous growth in donations and receiving more than 50 million in funding since the war began from over 125,000 donors. The average donation is $300. And we've spent 27 million of that already in our response and the need is great. Unfortunately, we see a drop in the donation as the world seems to think that the war is won, but the war is not over. There are many units still not supplied with equipment, and while the governments are promising the aid, it's slow getting there. We also see a growing humanitarian need with millions of internally displaced people who have lost their homes and their jobs, and we're fundraising to continue this work. We dream of building Ukraine, and we'll need as much help as possible to do that in the future. And this is where you can come in. We hope you'll join us.
there's more to this slide. Um, <laughs> so there is actually a really big IT community in Ukraine. Um, so what's different about this war, I think, is that everybody's watching it from their phones. I mean, everyone. Everyone in Ukraine is watching it from their phones. Lots of people here in, in Europe and the United States is watching it from their phones. And so are our kids from home. I mean, they're watching it on TikTok. And that's because Ukraine is so tech savvy. Um, so IT is among the top five industries in Ukraine. And even now, that industry is going really strong. Uh, IT professionals are still employed, even if displaced, and they continue to support the economy of Ukraine. And just as in open sources, where everyone submits a piece of code all together, they're able to withstand and resist Russia. This is how Ukraine operates, razum, together. Um, and so the logos featured here actually represent so many of the overwhelmingly generous companies that have supported our work so far. And that includes many employees, um, corporate social responsibility programs, founders and CEOs of, of various companies. And we're so very grateful because as we said, we're gonna all need to work together to rebuild our beautiful homeland. I also realized I forgot to introduce myself, so I guess I'll do that now. Sorry, a little jet lagged. Came all the way from Seattle. My name is Elena Nizhnikevich, and um, I'm Ukrainian American. First generation, my kids were born in Ukraine. And, um, you know, this is very personal to us. And I think the same is true for everyone at Razum. I mean, we've taken leaves of absence from our jobs. We have just worked seven days a week, many more hours a day than we thought was possible um, because our loved ones are there and, you know, they're fighting for a peaceful, good, free life. And, and we believe that we deserve it. And we also believe that we will win. Back to the tech guys. So Ukrainians in tech are so great. Um, they're creative problem solvers. We've had a lot of really innovative uh, founders, including Grammarly and PetCube, who have Ukrainian founders. And um, we see them as an opportunity to keep building the country. So in addition to donating to causes, and there are so many great causes that are helping Ukraine, including this conference today, thank you so much for this, we invite you to consider hiring Ukrainian IT professionals and investing in Ukrainian startups even before the war is over, we invite you to help us rebuild a prosperous Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I forgot the Azov style guy. Is that bad? That was wonderful. We want to help. And so CNCF has put together um, a, an LFX donation page. You can go to cncf.io slash Ukraine. Any funds raised will be split between Razom for Ukraine and Project Dwaretsky for our own Ihor directly. I really hope you will consider giving if you are able. Again, <clears throat> go to cncf.io slash Ukraine to make a contribution today. Let's do this, team. And for those looking for more options, we, I created a list here of uh, organizations that seem to be doing amazing work. Please feel free to check them out. Now, with very little time left, I am going to speed through the announcements, pick up the pace real fast. You'll meet a few more interesting people and have some fun. All right. Super quickly, KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe is coming back Amsterdam next year, April 17 to 21. Woo! Yes! <laughs> Second, remember I said earlier I have certification news? It's true. Prometheus Certified Associate is for beginners getting into observability. It's a, Prometheus is a major pillar of cloud native stacks and uh, we're happy to announce this new certificate. It's modeled after other Kubernetes certs, and it'll consist of a multiple, multiple choice online exam, and it'll help teach the best practices of monitoring cloud native applications. Beta testing will begin soon, and the exam will be generally available this year. Make sure to sign up. 
For those of you who came on Monday, you heard a little bit about this. I'm very excited to announce the beta version of the new cloud native network function certification program designed to help telecom a communication service provider industry in their adoption of cloud native technologies and best practices. I really wish I had more time to go into it, but integrates lots of CNCF projects, is based on test suite. I'm gonna keep going now. Um, <clears throat> and you can self-certify, go to cncf.io slash cnf. Um, speaking of expansion into new verticals, I would like to ask, how many of you came to this conference on a plane? Yep, most of us, right? Well, chances are you were on a Boeing plane. Boeing joins us as a CNCF Platinum member and it is one of the more sophisticated multi-cloud players in the space. Ricardo and Gina, please welcome to the stage. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose to join the foundation. Come on up. There you go. Uh, uh, thank you, Priyanka, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so, uh, I, am, I am really honored to be here and to be able to talk about Boeing's uh, commitment and partnership with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So 17 years ago, I was, I was the lead SRE in a Google war room uh, running a bunch of very terrible and extremely long bash one-liners to stand up uh, the world's first production board cluster. Um, We've come a long way since then, like an extremely long way. Today at Boeing, we are dedicated to building uh, ultra, high ultra high reliability, um, high integrity, mission critical software. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we're, in, in particular, we're working to leverage uh, the, the massive scalability and flexibility of public cloud deployments to build, uh, to build modern aerospace products and to deliver um, rapid in iteration and integration to our customers. One of the things that distinguishes Boeing as a, CNC as a CNCF partner is that we are truly dedicated and we really are committed to um, the belief that Kubernetes and cloud native solutions are uh, capable of, of extremely high reliability. In my Google SRE days, we used to think about five nines as kind of our reliability target, or, or what we describe now as, as 10 to the minus five. Um, at Boeing, we are, we are certain that we can be using Kubernetes to deliver products uh, and deploy products that, um, that can achieve reliability levels of 10 to the minus nine. Um, and so, so we're really honored to be, to be part of this partnership and to, and to really extend Kubernetes and cloud native solutions um, well into the future and, and, and uh, together change the world uh, in delivering extremely robust software deployments. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ricardo Torres. So he's our chief engineer of open source and cloud native computing uh, at Boeing. And um, thank you. Thanks, Jenna. As Jenna shared, <laughs> Do this clicker? Oh. As Jenna shared, Boeing is committed to writing high-integrity software from seabed to space with a few clouds sprinkled in. Under the Boeing umbrella, we have autonomous seafaring vessels collecting environmental data. We help put rockets into space, and soon you'll be able to see Tom Cruise as Maverick fly the Boeing-built FA-18 Super Hornet. While we are working to help take humanity to Mars and beyond, we never lose sight of the work we do here at home. I'm excited to see how we can bring together the worlds of cloud native and high integrity software to push the boundaries of what's possible. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank, Thank you. you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for your vote of confidence, Boeing. In addition to Boeing, we have many gold members joining us, Coinbase, Charter Communications, Softstone, and CE Cloud. Many people joining us today are end users. And so I would like to welcome on stage our latest head of end user ecosystem, who is going to give a fantastic talk to you, Taylor Dolezal. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> uh, howdy, everybody. A merry KubeCon Cloud Native Con to you all. Uh, hope you're staying hydrated uh, and getting far more steps on your watch than you're used to usually. I know I am. 
Uh, despite how sunny it's been here in Valencia, I've noticed that it's quite cloudy in this venue. I'm not sure if that's just me, but uh, okay, I had to get a couple in there. <laughs> As head of ecosystem at the CNCF, I'm focused on finding ways to enable cloud-native success for companies, individuals, and teams. I've worked with several of you on the Kubernetes project in various capacities, from releases to docs to assisting with other administrivia. For those of you whom I have not met yet, uh, I want to kind of tell you my story. To tell you that story, let's hop into a magical keynote time machine for a moment. And I believe if we can keep it at 88 puns an hour, we should be able to pull this off. First stop, our destination, Cleveland, Ohio. The year is 2012. We're at American Greetings, where I help create social frameworks to support our SEO and marketing team. Things are quite content as I'm on the content team. During my year spent here, I'll learn a variety of ways to wish someone a happy birthday, version my API endpoints, and create the organization's first ever meme generator. We have to have our start somewhere, right? Uh, unfortunately, that meme generator is no longer up, but I was able to save a picture on that front. Flash forward to the year 2012, location, the Cleveland Clinic. I first learned about Kubernetes, observe an open heart surgery, and work with teams to move medical assessments off of pen and paper into containers and clouds. Here, I get to help change patient care for people with neurological issues like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and concussions. Through this experience, I will architect infrastructure that provides both doctors and patients insight about their treatments and gives them a feedback loop about their wellness. Uh, if you thought CICD was crazy, uh, being able to give this to patients is fantastic. Flash forward again to 2016, and a long way from Cleveland, uh, where I get, to, uh, I get to go to Los Angeles. I can say that I miss the snow in the Midwest, but uh, I, I, do miss, uh, I do miss all of the foods, unfortunately. It's really good pierogies, things like that. Just can't find it in LA. It's a bummer. Disney Studios is where I teach teams to work with cloud-native technologies, reshape the studio's approach to incident management, and lead the SRE team. That team goes on to manage over 450-plus different services. Now, if you think having one service down is a, is a handful, uh, uh, more than that is more of a handful. Disney, as an organization, has mastered the art of how to tell a story, but I'll soon learn that it's the most interesting stories happen around 3 a.m. on incident calls. It's not a good idea to assume, but in most cases, you can assume it's DNS. In 2020 at HashiCorp, I get to work with teams on infrastructure creation with Terraform, Waypoint, and the rest of the HashiCorp suite of tools. I learned that there is more than one way to get things done many different ways to see a problem. Working as a developer advocate, I gained an understanding in how to coalesce product engineering and developer experience concerns to create workflows that are awesome and scalable and shareable as well. I've spent time implementing uh, infrastructure at all of these companies, and now I get to work with all of you in highlighting operational success stories and helping teams quantify best practices for all. Uh, today, uh, on the topic of focus and best practice, later today, we're going to have our first ever CTO Summit, where we gather knowledgeable end users to discuss the topic, uh, the topic of resiliency in multi-cloud. What does that mean? Uh, does that mean that you're using Excel and Google Sheets? Probably not. We'll, we'll find out on that front. <laughs> uh, if you have those deep organization-wide insights and you want to participate in our next one uh, at KubeCon Cloud Native Con NA in Detroit, please keep an eye out as we're going to have a sign-up sheet in a few weeks. I'm filled with enthusiasm and limitless amounts of puns to help guide you on your Cloud Native journey. Orange, you're glad that we get to work on this together? I know I am. All right, I'm going to peel on out of here, and I'd like to turn things back over to Priyanka. I truly hope that you enjoy the conference. Find me as at OnlyDole anywhere online if you want to have a chat, 
or find me in the hallway track. I'll be wearing this jacket. It's reversible, though, so if I'm trying to blend in with a crowd, uh, look, for, look for the other side. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Have a good one. All right. Awesome, Taylor. Thank you. All right, folks. Taylor, just like all of you, is an awesome human of Cloud Native. And if you think you have a story or someone you know has a story that's deep and insightful and tells us about our values, I would encourage you to find the Humans of Cloud Native booth in the sponsor showcase area today and actually throughout the day in Pavilion 2 near the CNCF projects. You'll be meeting Charlie there and she would love to hear about your stories so we can feature them in the future. And with that, that's all I had to say. Thank you for joining us today and this week. Remember what Ehor said and live each day with the ideals of kindness, collaboration, and respect. And now, let's get the show going with a presentation from one of the favorite companies I've seen lately, Mercedes-Benz.